And so we come to the end of the first era of Godzilla movies. Terror of Mechagodzilla is a direct sequel to the last movie, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. It came out in 1975 under the Japanese title Mechagodzilla's Counterattack, and then in the United States it went through a weird history with one of the titles being The Terror of Godzilla, which makes absolute no sense because Mechagodzilla is the bad guy, but I'll elaborate more on that near the end of the review. Anyway, as I mentioned beforehand, this is a direct sequel to the last movie, right down to the point where they even do a recap during the opening title sequence, similar to how the Rocky movies did recaps between 2 and 5. So the leader of the aliens from the third planet of the black hole, wow that's a mouthful, has survived the events of the first movie, even though he was shot in the throat and he turned into a monkey, but whatever, we'll just go with it because it's the same actor. Anyway, a deep diving team goes down to the bottom of the ocean where Mechagodzilla was destroyed and tried to scavenge all of his parts. They're unsuccessful because all of the space titanium is gone. And then suddenly the crew of this submarine are attacked and killed by an aquatic dinosaur named Titanosaurus. Soon we find out about this scientist named Dr. Mifuni, played by Akihito Hirata, and his weird experiments in commanding sea life, and Titanosaurus just happens to be his weapon for vengeance on humanity, for basically laughing him out of the room based on his ridiculous experiments, which... I mean, they work, but they're still damn ridiculous. So he teams up with the aliens from the third planet of the Black Hole, uh, who have reconstructed Mechagodzilla from all the space titanium that they salvaged. And this is mainly due to the fact that they saved his daughter, Katsura, so he kind of owes them a favor. But it's really horrifying considering that they turned his daughter into a cyborg, who is only there to control Mechagodzilla. God, these aliens are so selfish and savage, which I'll elaborate more on a little later. So anyway, both Titanosaurus and Mechagodzilla go on a rampage across Tokyo, but it's up to Godzilla and... Oh wait, there is no ally. Godzilla's on his own on this movie to fight off Mechagodzilla and Titanosaurus. So this is the end of an era for a couple reasons. It's the last Godzilla film in the original series, and it's the final film to be directed by Ishiro Honda. After this, Honda would retire from making solo movies, but he would still work with his good friend Akira Kurosawa on several films. In fact, the tunnel sequence in Akira Kurosawa's Dreams was directed by Ishiro Honda based off of a passion project that he wanted to do. But Terror of Mechagodzilla feels like Ishiro Honda's big send-off, and it couldn't be more appropriate because Godzilla pretty much defined his career, so it makes sense that his final directing gig, Solo, would be the final Godzilla movie in the original series. And if we're only taking the Mechagodzilla movies as their own individual films, this is one of those instances where the sequel is actually better than the original. It does have its issues though. For one, the human characters outside of Katsura are not that memorable and they're kind of dull. This might have to do with the fact that this is the first Godzilla movie that Honda directed after the traditional studio system in Japan got scrapped in 1970. The reason you saw so many of the same actors in different roles in all of the Godzilla movies in the 60s was because that they were contracted by Toho to make these certain films. In 1970, this studio system in Japan was scrapped, and the last science fiction film to be made under this old studio system was Ashiro Honda's Space Amoeba. So that's my reasoning to why the human characters aren't super interesting compared to Honda's other films. And what also kind of hurts is that this movie spends a lot of time focused on the human characters. However, I will be fair and say that most of the focus is on Tomoko Ai's character, Katsura, who is fantastic in this film. She is one of the few human characters throughout the entire franchise that you really care about because she's conflicted with everyone on Earth, but she has to stay loyal to her dad and the aliens, and she's pretty much made a slave by the aliens from the third planet of the black hole. Like, the aliens in this movie are downright savage. Both Ishiro Honda and screenwriter Yokiko Takayama really did a great job of making the aliens in this movie downright despicable. Because in the last movie, the leader of the alien race, the most evil thing that he did was drink whiskey and smoke a cigar as he was watching Mechagodzilla cause a bunch of destruction. It's cheesy, but then again, the aliens' costumes are very cheesy, even for the 70s. In this movie, they are downright evil. Like I mentioned before, they pretty much enslave Katsuda, they blackmail Dr. Mifune to work for them, and the leader of the alien race even whips other aliens that he works with with an actual Indiana Jones-style whip and sends them to be executed. And you're like, 
Whoa! Once we got to the scene where the leader is whipping his henchmen, I was like, I don't remember this at all. And this will actually lead into my discussion later on on the history of the American version of Terror Mechagodzilla, but we'll get to that later on. Another issue with a lot of the movie being focused on the human characters, even if the villains and Katsura are interesting, is that Godzilla doesn't really appear until 45 minutes in, and Mechagodzilla doesn't even activate until an hour into the movie. But once Mechagodzilla is activated, the entire movie is nothing but entertaining. Even if this Mechagodzilla seems a little static this time around, because Mechagodzilla just kind of stands around. Titanosaurus actually does a lot of the fighting, and Mechagodzilla just doesn't seem that big of a threat, especially considering that he activates an hour into the movie. But at the same time, I found this movie a lot more entertaining than the last film was. Because even though the main character is kind of a dud and all the other hero characters are not that interesting, it's Katsura that really makes the movie for me. I was completely invested in her character, all the dilemmas that she had to go through in between serving the aliens or wanting to defy them and help the people of Earth. There are a lot of flashbacks in this movie that show Katsura's tragedy and how she was pretty much enslaved to be a cyborg, and it can be touching at points. I really felt something for Katsuda throughout this whole movie, especially near the end when she has to sacrifice herself in order to save humanity. Quite literally, because the aliens reconstructed her insides to basically control Mechagodzilla without a control panel, and the only way Mechagodzilla can be defeated is if she dies. So she ends up killing herself, allowing Mechagodzilla to be officially deactivated, allowing Godzilla to destroy Mechagodzilla. At this point, she is definitely the most complex human character since Emiko in the original Godzilla, and it's very fitting that this would be Honda's work yet again. Another great thing about the film is the score by Akira Ifakube. This was intended to be his last Godzilla score, and he makes it one of his darker scores. During the flashbacks that I mentioned with Katsura, the organ plays a lot, and it's very tragic, it fits the tone, and even brings back the original theme from the first Godzilla movie as Godzilla's theme. Because throughout all the other movies he scored, Godzilla's theme was dun 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 dun. And in this movie, Godzilla's theme is dun 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 dun. It's just like in the Indiana Jones movies where there are technically two themes: the do 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 or do 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 do. So it's great to hear that theme back once again. And later on, those two themes would be combined to be the official Godzilla theme. And then I mentioned after Mechagodzilla is activated, even if you had to wait an hour, it's entertaining. It's got all of the city destructions that you could ask for, and it's got some impressive camera moves during the monster sequences where the camera will pan around the monsters. And Teriyoshi Nakano said that this was because he was working with Hashiro Honda, because Honda allowed a lot more creative freedom with all the camera moves that Nakano wanted to do. Like I said, it's definitely entertaining, and I like it better than the first because it actually had some sort of of human element that I cared about. However, I'm going to give it the same rating I gave Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, which is good, but not great. The rest of the human characters are definitely lacking, and it does take a long time before the monster action comes into play. But the special fix sequences are still a lot of fun, the score is great, and I really appreciate how Titanosaurus is a more simple looking monster, because all the other monsters beforehand were just a little wacky in terms of their designs. Titanosaurus is something you'd see alongside Anguirus or Rodan, except he was designed pretty late in the original series. So it's a pretty good movie in my opinion, and actually a very fitting way to close out the original Godzilla series. I mean, outside of the fact that this is the lowest grossing Godzilla film in Japan, it just felt like the appropriate way to end the series. Now, in terms of the actual US release, there's not much to say, but the history of how Terror of Mechagodzilla came to the United States is pretty fascinating. You've heard me mention Henry G. Saperstein several times beforehand. Well, he got the television rights to air Terror of Mechagodzilla, while someone else named Bob Kahn got the US theatrical rights for Terror of Mechagodzilla. So basically, there were two versions of Terror of Mechagodzilla in the United States. The version that Henry G. Saperstein released had a nine minute prologue at the beginning of the film, which actually makes this the only time the American version is longer than the Japanese version. But all this prologue consists of is stock footage detailing the 
history of Godzilla, and it uses stock footage from Invasion of the Astro Monster and All Monsters Attack, which that movie in itself used stock footage from Son of Godzilla and Ebira Horror of the Deep. But after that, the rest of the movie is mostly uncut. There is one moment in the movie that was cut from the Japanese version, and those are the prosthetic boobs on Katsura that are shown on the operating table in the Japanese version. I get why they were cut out, but at the same time, these boobs are just so incredibly fake. It's obvious that it's a mannequin. But the rest of the movie is pretty much exactly as it is in the Japanese version. Bob Kahn's version of Terror of Mechagodzilla, on the other hand, was completely butchered for its theatrical release. For one, it was renamed The Terror of Godzilla, which as I mentioned, doesn't make sense since Mechagodzilla is the bad guy. And on top of all that, he cut this movie to pieces. He pretty much neutered Terror of Mechagodzilla, removing any kind of violence that he would feel as inappropriate to kids because he wanted this movie to get a G rating. So that means people getting shot was cut out, that means the alien whipping his henchman was cut out, which is actually why I don't remember that sequence very well. And he altered the ending where we don't see Katsuda shoot herself to deactivate Mechagodzilla. Mechagodzilla just kind of deactivates, so he cut out one of the most important and emotional plot points throughout the entire film, and it's bullshit. And again, this was all done to get a G rating. Now here's the actual reason why I don't remember the whipping scene. When Terror of Mechagodzilla came out on VHS, Bob Kahn's version of the film was used instead of Henry G. Saperstein's, which I think was done by mistake, so Toho requested a new title card to be put on the movie, so it said Terror of Mechagodzilla. But ever since its VHS release and up until the classic media DVD from 2007, the Terror of Godzilla was the only version of Terror of Mechagodzilla that I ever saw. It wasn't until classic media released Henry G. Saperstein's American version and the original Japanese version where I got to see Terror of Mechagodzilla as it was intended to be. So that is definitely a unique history for this movie. And even though the movies weren't really heavily altered in terms of adding music or just adding scenes with American actors, it has more of a fascinating history than any of the other American releases for Godzilla films. And that's my review for Terror of Mechagodzilla. After this movie, the series would go on hiatus and there would not be a new Godzilla movie until 1984. Now, I'm going to be taking a break from Godzilla because I have not caught up watching all the movies in the second and third era of Godzilla, so I need some time to play catch up and do all the reviews. So I do apologize if you're disappointed that you're not getting one Godzilla review a day, but you got to keep in mind, now that my reviews are a little more complex than they were five years ago, a lot more work has to go into them, and it's all me doing it. So I will get back into reviewing the rest of the series on April 13th, which ironically, is Friday the 13th. And the movie I will be tackling on that day will be The Return of Godzilla and its American counterpart, Godzilla 1985. So until then, I hope you enjoyed this review. Leave a comment down below and tell me what your thoughts are on the movie, if and when you've seen it. And as always, this is The Real Mr. Robinson telling you there's only one.